River rivers don't go from a trickle to to you know to a little deeper, deeper, deeper without a tributary. Well, I think that's an indication. Unless you want to argue, I don't. Maybe some people argue this. I don't even know. I haven't investigated it to this extent. Unless someone wanted to argue that the river is just a supernatural river, but if it's a supernatural river, maybe it's just symbolic, <laughs> right? I mean, if you begin to say, is this really a natural thing? If it's a natural thing, then why, why aren't there tributaries? That's what would be natural. And I, I think the same is true for the tree of life for healing. That's symbolic of the healing. People don't need healing in the new creation. It's having, having the tree of life for healing in the new creation is just a symbol of the fact that everything's perfect there, that, uh, that, it, that it's a, a perfect a perfect place, a perfect city. So the name of the Lord is in the city. So, so what I understand Ezekiel to be saying, this the promises here are fulfilled in part. They're fulfilled in part in the return from exile, right? But they're fulfilled ultimately. They're fulfilled ultimately in the new creation, when uh, all, when the the full fulfillment comes in the new heavens and the new earth. So, anything you want to say about Ezekiel? Yeah. Uh, for Ezekiel 28, with in, in regards to the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre, yeah. um, do you see that as the human ruler and the demonic ruler, um, kind of similar to the Isaiah 14 thing? Or, um, I definitely see it as the human ruler. Is there is Satan behind that? I, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Perhaps, perhaps I'm o- I'm open to that. I, I I would you know some people say it's only Satan. I don't hold that view. I think it's clearly the leader of Tyre. Is that also a reference to Satan? Maybe so. Starts out with um, raising a complaint against the prince of Tyre, and then starting in verse uh, eleven. It does to the king of Tyre and describes him being an Eden cherub, uh, like or cherub, cherub. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, if you. No, I, I think that language is very, very symbolic. So I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily saying he's literally an Eden. So I, you know, it's in the prophets, it's poetry. So then that's why it's hard to be sure. When he's saying he's an Eden, I don't think he's saying he's literally an Eden. I think it's the way of the author saying, you live in, in a beautiful society. So you could say, so to speak, those of, uh, those of you who live in Los Angeles live in Eden. And in, in a sense, that's true, right? We live not just Los Angeles, but at least we live in the richest society in the history of the world. We live in more comfort in our homes than kings did in the past now. I mean, it's amazing. So, you know, you could say, you have an Eden-like existence, but it's poetry. So, but, but some people might say, no, it's literal. Well, that's where it gets, you know, maybe I should say something hermeneutically, because some people say, well, you ought to interpret the Bible. I don't think you're taught this here, but I don't know. Uh, you, you ought to interpret the Bible as literally as possible. That rule is not a fair rule, right? I was taught that as a young student. You ought to interpret the Bible as literally as possible. Why is that not a fair rule? Because you have to interpret according to the intention of the author. And what if the author wants to use symbolism? You you can't, that's cheating, right? To say in advance, well, it can't be symbolic. That's cheating. (laughs) Because that's the question. You You can't make a rule, you can't make a rule before you interpret the text. So that, that, that's why her, that's why interpreting the Bible's not always easy. How literal is it? What is he intending? Is he intending it to be more symbolic, or is he intending it to be more um, literal? So that's that's a tough question. Yeah. Anything else on Ezekiel you want to say? Forty through forty-eight, or anything? No? Okay. Uh, I'll ask. Why would you see him being so, if it's going to be a symbolic temple, 
why the specificity is he laying this out over all these chapters to go into all the details? Is he just talking about the holiness of it and trying to get at that? I, mean, I think it's poetic for a fact. You know, it's a way of, uh, you, you know, you, 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 you linger on it and lovingly describe it to give us the, the, you know, if you just give a few lines, it gives you an effect, a, 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 a sense of, in terms of your imagination of, of the beauty of what this will be. Now, I mean, what, <laughs> what Ezekiel was thinking, how his hearers understood this, I don't know. I mean, that's, this, these are very difficult chapters, aren't they? So I think a, I think a problem uh, a problem with taking it literally referring to the millennium is that the Old Testament sacrifices would be re repristinated. And, uh, and of course, I mean, some people say, um, at least historically in dispensationalism, I don't know if that's still said here, but some people, a lot of dispensationalists don't hold this view anymore, though. But in the past, some dispensationalists said, well, they're a memorial. But I think that's a very strange view because the memorial is the Lord's Supper. We already have a memorial. And then to go backwards to the memorial being animal sacrifices, I think it's a very, very odd conception anyway. And seems, seems to sit very awkwardly with the book of Hebrews as well. That suddenly you're going back to animal sacrifices even in a memorial way, that's because we have the memorial. Why wouldn't they celebrate the Lord's Supper as the memorial? Uh, so, I mean, there's still some who still take it as literal, but um, I, w I went to Western Seminary in the, you know, which was dispensational in the 1970s, and my, several of the professors there argued that it was not literal. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about Daniel. Uh, in Daniel, you have Yahweh's sovereignty over history. Uh, many people see these parallels, right? You see the dates. Yahweh's sovereign over history, chapters 2 through 7. Yahweh delivers his own, chapters 3 through 6. Yahweh humbles the, the I should say, the proud. The pride. Um. Of course, this is an exilic book, isn't it? This is Israel in exile. <clears throat> so one of the themes is, what are the people of God called to do during exile? They're called to be faithful, right? So we see the faithfulness of Daniel and his friends in chapter 1, not eating unclean food. We see the faithfulness of the three men in chapter 3 who don't worship idols. We see Daniel's faithfulness in chapter 6, where he's thrown in the lion's den, or continuing to pray to the Lord. So they, they function as examples of covenant faithfulness in a nation where there's been covenant violation. Secondly, <clears throat> Yahweh humbles the, the proud. He shows he's sovereign. He humbles, in chapter 4, proud Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 5, he humbles proud Belshazzar. Dan By the way, Jim Hamilton makes this point, just to be quick about this. Daniel seems to be a repristination in many ways of Joseph. Joseph anticipates Daniel in many ways. So that, that's a very, very interesting parallel that Ham Hamilton brings out. So, you know, we're, we're talking about one of the greatest empires in, in history, and we're reminded that God humbles the, 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 the proud. You know, whatever, you know, whatever you say, I'm not making a political comment here, whatever you say about Donald Trump politically, one of the problems is his pride, <laughs> which is so blatant and over the top. And, we, and, and such pride, you know, to advertise yourself as a genius and so forth and so on. That is, that is something we know God is not pleased with. So um, that, that's a real tendency um, for all rulers, isn't it? For, for, for rulers to 
to, to irrigate to, to themselves godlike properties. And then Daniel reminds us, no matter how great you are or how great the nation is that you lead, God will ultimately humble those who are proud. And uh, he does not brook, he does not brook anyone who competes with him. And then Yahweh's sovereignty over history. So we see Nebuchadnezzar's dream and its interpretation, which Daniel gives. And then we see um, the, um, the vision in chapter 7. So the head of gold, right? Real, I'm, you're familiar with this. Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, media Persia, the stomach and thighs of bronze, Greece, the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay, Rome. Then with the vision, the same, right? The lion is Babylon. Then comes Media Persia with the bear. Then comes Greece with the leopard. And then the indescribable ferocious beast is Rome. So, so sort of a schematic of history, right? So, uh, Dan Daniel's telling us Right? What is Daniel telling us? The exile, in, in, a, in a sense, the exile isn't over, right? I mean, what, what do you expect reading uh, the other prophets? <laughs> you expect the exile is over when you return to the land. But, in, but Daniel's telling us the exile is going to, even though they're in the land, the exile is going to continue in the sense that other nations are going to be stronger than Israel. So, Chapter 7, such is so important for the New Testament. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> Who rides on the clouds of heaven? Yahweh. Right? That's what those passages say. He, he approached the Ancient of Days. That's that's God, and was escorted before him. He was given, given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So here's the point of the vision, right? The kingdoms of the world, they're like what? Ferocious beasts. They're like lions and leopards and bears. And what... Are, you know, we, we're, not, we're not familiar with this in our world, right? I have never really been in a case where I've been afraid of an animal tearing me to pieces. But they lived in that world, right? When we lived in Minnesota, we lived right next to the Como Park Zoo. And it was five minutes from our house, and it was free. We'd go over there all the time. And one of the things I would do is they had these beautiful Siberian tigers. I just love seeing those tigers. So, they, you know, I'd stand next, you know, I'd be that far from him. Zach is to me, right? Or right that, and I'd imagine to myself, imagine if there weren't bars there, right? I'd be terrified. But it wouldn't work, you know? I'd try, but the, you can't. I'd try to say, I imagine the bars aren't there. How would I feel? But it, it's too fakey, right? Because I try to, I can't, I couldn't feel afraid because I knew the bars were there, you know? But imagine, imagine if you try to, that, that would be so scary to be next to those tigers. I mean, what would they do? They were so beautiful and so massive. But that's what he's saying. That's what the, that's what the governments of the world are like. Oh, you know, you know, the Bible is just so separate from everyday life and true life the way it really is. I mean, of course, the kingdoms of the world are not like that at all, are they? Yeah, no, not like that at all. Like in the 20th century, what a wonderful century it was. When, you know, Stalin, how many did he kill? 20 to 50 million? Oh, yeah. 20, 30, 40, 50 million here or there. We're talking about individual people. 20 to 50 million. Right? Mao? What are the guesses? They don't know. In the millions. In the millions were killed. Millions and millions. Pol Pot? Cambodia? so forth and so on. The kingdoms of this world, right? The governments of this world, it includes our government in the United States as well. They want, they want total power. And when they get total power, they're ferocious. Like 
with animals, like beasts that tear people apart. Totalitarian government, it's dangerous, isn't it? It's dangerous, it's rapacious, it's savage, it's fierce, but a kingdom's coming that'll be humane. Son of man, what does son of man mean? Human. There's a human kingdom coming. There's a, there's a king coming who actually cares about the citizens. Now, I don't want to be simplistic. Some governments are better than others, right, throughout history. Of course, of course, of course. Some governments have been more influenced by Christian values. Some, some, some leaders, because of common grace, haven't been Christians and have been relatively good, right? But, but the tendency of, of human beings, the tendency is to get absolute power and destroy those they disagree with. Well, the Son of Man, a kingdom is coming. It's going to be one that cares for people. Okay, now that's the vision. Now, here's a fascinating thing. How does Daniel explain the vision? He says, he explains it three times. But the holy ones and the most high will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever, Daniel 7.18. Daniel 7, 21 and 22, as I was watching the horn waged war against the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the ancient of days arrived, and a judgment was given in favor of the holy ones of the Most High for the time had come and the holy ones took possession of the kingdom. But the court will convene and its dominion will be taken away to be completely destroyed forever. The kingdom, dominion, and greatness of the kingdoms under all of heaven will be given to the people, the holy ones of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will serve and obey him. When Daniel, so the vision is in 7, 1 through 14. The explanation of the vision, did you catch this? The explanation of the vision, who gets the kingdom? The saints get it. The holy ones get it. Nothing about an individual. The saints get it. Actually, some people actually argue the holy ones here refer to angels, but I think right here, is, I, I put this in bold, right? Ah, it's the people. It's the people. The whole, so it's not saints. It's the, so, so who gets the kingdom, according to Daniel? Israel. The people of Israel, right? That's certainly what Daniel's saying. It's going to, he's saying to a people in exile, the kingdom's coming to you. The kingdom's coming to you. Well, what about the Son of Man? The Son of Man, I would argue, what we have here is an example of a both and. The Son of Man represents the people. Just like with the lion, the bear and the leopard, the king, represents the people. So the Son of Man, the Son of Man, who is the Son of Man? The Son of Man is the true Israel. The servant of the Lord, remember? The servant of the Lord is the true Israel. The Son of Man is the true Israel. But the servant of the Lord incorporates in himself what? His people. So does the Son of Man. So it's not an either or. The king represents the people. The Son of Man is an individual, but it's also corporate. There's corporate solidarity. He plays a representative role. So important. When That is why when we come to the New Testament, that is why when we come to the New Testament and Jesus speaks of the Son of Man, it's not like everybody says, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We know exactly what you're talking about. Instead, it's a little bit like, what does that mean, that son of man stuff? <laughs> you see? It's not instantly clear to people. If Jesus had just said, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Davidic king, okay, okay. But instead he says, I'm the son of man. But what does son of man mean in Daniel? Is it just talking about the saints? Are you just saying, are, are, what, what are you saying? It wasn't, they just wondered about what the significance of that meant. We, we could talk about other things. 
about Daniel, but we, but we should talk, say something about Daniel 9. I already said this, really. Daniel's reading the prophecies of Jeremiah about a 70-year captivity, and the <coughs> Lord says, you know, Jeremiah's not wrong, but it's going to be more time, 70 weeks. Not just 70 years, 70 weeks. I decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to atone for iniquity. I understand. You know, the stop to sin, atoning for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. At least I understand those things to be fulfilled in the cross. No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and to tell an anointed one, the ruler... will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in difficult times. After those 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood. And until the end, there will be war, desolations are decreed. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And the abomination of desolation will be on the wing of the temple and the decreed destruction is poured out in the desolator. Well, this is a very difficult passage. This is a very controversial passage. And I'm open to changing my mind on this, but at the present time, I agree that the anointed one, the ruler, which is, is that Nagid? You know Hebrew? Nagid, right? Isn't it there? Should we look at that? We won't worry about that, whatever the word is. We don't have time to look at that. But I understand the ruler there to be Jesus, right? He's the anointed one. He's the ruler until he comes. And then after those 62 weeks, the anointed one, that's Jesus, will be cut off, will be cut off and the people of the coming ruler. Now, here's a big part into the ways. I'm, I wouldn't die for this. I would not be persecuted for this, right? I told you that before. So if you want to persecute me, I'll come right over. It is Nike. Yeah, yeah. The people of the coming ruler. I agree with Peter Gentry, who's written a detailed article about this, that the, that the ruler here is still Jesus. That he doesn't switch. You know, many interpreters take it that way. He doesn't switch because many others interpret that to refer to a, an antichrist figure or something like that. The people of the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. I understand that to mean because of the Jews' sin, the city is destroyed. Who, who are the people of the coming ruler? It's the Jews. They destroy their own city. The focus isn't on what another nation does, but on their own self-destruction because of their sin. The end will come with a flood. So who will make a firm covenant with many for one week? That's Jesus himself. Jesus will make a covenant with many for one week, the covenant in his blood. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. Sacrifices and offerings are stopped because he's the fulfillment of all sacrifices and offering. And yes, the abomination of desolation will be on the wing of the temple until the creed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Maybe that's even fulfilled in AD 70 that abomination of desolation. I'm not saying there isn't necessarily a future fulfillment. But that's a different way of reading Daniel 9, that it's, that it's not, not, not speaking, it's not speaking mainly of an antichrist, but Jesus is the coming ruler. The covenant he makes with his people is in his blood, and it's fulfilled um, in his sacrifice. So, any questions or comments on Daniel? Yeah. I know you're not really counts to that, but it's that the anointed one will not be. How would you... Well, well, which part are we talking about? Uh, right at the break of the next last page, so the, the next page, the very end of it. If you go forward, All up, up above. It's the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Well, yeah, that's talking about his death. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's when he dies. Yeah, that's when Jesus is put to death. Yeah. But, I mean, that's not the end of the story. Yeah. 
Anything else you want to say about Daniel? Anything you want to say about anything? Because I don't really think we should start. I wanted to finish the book of the 12 today, but I can finish that quickly. We can run through that quickly. We'll start the New Testament tomorrow, but I really, at 5 to 12, I don't really want to start something new. That's why you can say anything about anything if you want to right now. We could talk about sports. We could talk about Chipotle, my favorite restaurant. <laughs> anyway, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Oh, yeah, question, question. Well, I was just going to ask about uh, the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar um, in Daniel. The conversion? You, uh, I, don't, I don't think he was really converted. I think he recognizes Yahweh as sovereign, but I don't understand that to be his conversion. It could be, could be. But I just don't, um, yeah, I tend to think that's just a recognition of Yahweh's authority. But maybe, maybe he was converted. Let's hope so, you know. Will we see him again? We know in heaven when we meet, you know, if you're right, I'll, you know, I'll pay you back somehow. How do, how, how will I do that in heaven, right? So, okay. Have a good day. We'll see you tomorrow, bright and early.